Let's state the obvious. If you don't know the definitions of common geometry words, then you will not succeed on SAT geometry questions. Many American students forget geometry vocabulary because they took geometry as a class several years before they take the SAT. Many non-native English speakers struggle with geometry questions because they never learned the English words for common geometry ideas. This lesson will cover the essential vocabulary, as well as some more obscure words that you might see on difficult questions. A polygon is a closed figure with straight sides. In other words, a polygon is a shape. Triangles are polygons, and so are the various types of four-sided shapes, which we collectively call quadrilaterals. A pentagon is a polygon with five sides, and a hexagon is a polygon with six sides. A regular polygon has all sides equal and all angles equal. You can see that the regular pentagon looks well-balanced because all of its sides are equal, and so are each of its interior angles. The irregular pentagon still has the required five sides to be called a pentagon, but those sides don't have any real pattern. On very hard questions, you might also hear a polygon described as convex or concave. The pentagon on the left is convex because all of its interior angles are less than 180 degrees. The pentagon on the right is concave because it has at least one interior angle that is greater than 180 degrees. The SAT often describes one shape as inscribed within another, which means that it's completely enclosed by the other shape, with the edges just barely touching each other. Pay close attention to the order of the words in the question. As you can see, the circle inscribed in a square on the left looks very different from the square inscribed in a circle on the right. I doubt the SAT would ever use the word circumscribes, but it basically means the opposite of inscribed. On the left, a square circumscribes a circle. On the right, a circle circumscribes a square. Again, I doubt you'd ever see the word circumscribes on the SAT, but there is a very good chance that you would see the word inscribed. When comparing two shapes, we might say that they are congruent or similar. Congruent shapes are identical. They have matching sides and matching angles. Similar shapes are proportional. They are different sizes, but they still have matching angles. The sides will be in proportion, meaning that the size difference is consistent. In both cases, it's important that you pay attention to which sides and angles correspond. On the left, it's obvious that these two sides correspond, and these are corresponding angles, so we know they have the same measure. On the right, we would still say that the two bases correspond, even though they have different lengths. These are still two corresponding angles, and they still have the same measure. Let's look at some other words to know for polygons. A vertex is a corner on any kind of shape. The plural of vertex is vertices. A diagonal is an interior line that connects two vertices. A diagonal does not need to go directly across a shape. The perimeter is the outside distance covered by all of the sides. The area is the inside space taken up by the shape. Remember that perimeter and area are two different measurements. A perimeter could be measured in feet, but an area would be measured in square feet. These are two completely different units, even though both use the word feet. An interior angle is on a vertex and opens into the shape. An exterior angle is on the outside, but you would need to continue one of the sides to form an exterior angle. You're unlikely to see this term on the SAT, but you might see an exterior angle on a picture that is already drawn for you. Circles have their own unique vocabulary. The perimeter of a circle is called the circumference. The radius is the distance from the center of the circle to any point on the circle. The diameter is twice the radius. It goes completely across the circle through the center. If it doesn't go through the center, it's simply called a chord. A tangent line touches the circle exactly once. Typically, the line continues on past the circle, but we can also have a segment that is tangent to a circle and stops at the point of tangency. We should also be clear that the language we use to talk about points in circles needs to be precise. A point on a circle must be somewhere on the outer edge. Only points on a circle will fit into the equation of a circle in the xy plane. Other points might be inside or outside of the circle. Lots of people also get confused about circle sectors, which are slices of the circle that are anchored on the center. Specifically, they get confused between the arc length and the arc measure. Either way, we're talking about the piece of the circumference that the sector opens up to. 
You might also see it described as a minor arc, but the SAT often just calls it an arc. The length of the arc is the distance that it covers, which can be in any distance unit like feet, inches, or centimeters. It's going to be some fraction of the circumference, and it may still include the number pi. The measure of the arc is not a distance. It can only be in two possible units, either degrees or radians. If it's in radians, you might still have a pi, but it's not really related to the circumference. The measure of the arc is a proportion, just like an angle measure. The entire circle is always the same total arc measure, either 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. For circle sectors, the arc measure is always the same as the measure of the central angle, where the sector starts at the center of the circle. Very rarely, a circle question might include an inscribed angle, which is anchored on the circle itself. Backing up a bit, let's talk more about lines. Technically, a line goes on forever in both directions. A line segment has endpoints. When the SAT talks about a segment, they basically just mean a line. As you know, lines can be parallel, meaning that they move in the same direction. Or they can be perpendicular, which means that they form a right angle. A line that cuts something in half is known as a bisector. A bisector bisects another line or an angle. The bisectors here are in red. The black line on the left is bisected, meaning that both the top and the bottom are the same length of 5 inches, so the entire black line is 10 inches. The spot where these lines intersect is the midpoint of the black line. A line can also bisect an angle, meaning that both angles are the same measure. On the right, a 64 degree angle was bisected into two 32 degree angles. There are specific types of triangles that you also need to be aware of. An equilateral triangle has three equal sides and three equal angles, all of which are always 60 degrees. A right triangle has a right angle. The side opposite the right angle is known as the hypotenuse, and the other two sides are called legs. An isosceles triangle has just two equal sides. Those sides are always opposite two equal angles. As a bonus, you should also know that an isosceles right triangle is always the special 45-45-90 right triangle. The formulas for this particular triangle are given in the SAT reference sheet. No matter what kind of triangle you have, you might need to draw an altitude, especially if you're trying to find the area of the triangle. An altitude is more commonly called the height of the triangle. For right triangles, we can just use one of the legs as the height and altitude in most cases. But to find the area of this isosceles triangle, we would need to draw an altitude that is perpendicular to the base. Even in right triangles, we sometimes need to work with an altitude depending on what we're being asked to do. Notice that the altitude does not need to go up and down. It just needs to be perpendicular to one of the sides. We can also quickly talk about the different types of quadrilaterals, which, remember, are four-sided shapes. For the SAT, you're almost always going to be working with squares and rectangles. In both cases, all angles are right angles, meaning that they are 90 degrees. In a square, all the sides are the same exact length. In a rectangle, the opposite sides are congruent. In both cases, the opposite sides are also parallel. And remember that all squares are rectangles, so if you need to invent a random rectangle for a question, it might be easier to just make it a square. There are some other types of quadrilaterals that could occasionally appear on an SAT. A parallelogram has opposite sides that are equal. More importantly, the opposite sides are parallel. If a question involves a parallelogram, there's a very good chance that the parallel sides matter in some way. A trapezoid has just one pair of parallel sides. If the other pair of sides are equal length, then it's an isosceles trapezoid, but they can also be different lengths. A rhombus is very unlikely to show up on an SAT, but it's basically a parallelogram with all equal sides. But remember that there are lots of quadrilaterals that don't have specific names. These weird quadrilaterals still obey the interior angle rule for four-sided shapes, which is that all quadrilaterals have interior angles that add to 360 degrees. Moving on to three-dimensional shapes, you hopefully recognize these diagrams from the SAT reference sheet, which gives us the volume formulas for each one. You do not need to memorize the volume formulas, but you do need to memorize the names of the shapes. From left to right, we have a right rectangular prism, a right circular cylinder, a sphere, a right circular cone, and a right rectangular pyramid. If the SAT uses those longer names, don't panic. Just memorize the short names here and you'll know which formula to use. 
You should also watch my lesson on the reference sheet for more information on the dimensions of these shapes. For now, I'll just remind you that some of these shapes have dimensions that are not listed. The cone and pyramid have a slant height in addition to the regular height. The pyramid also has an edge length that connects the top of the pyramid to the corners of the base. Some very hard SAT questions might ask about these parts of the cone and pyramid. You should also be comfortable understanding the word base, which has a different meaning when we're working in three dimensions. Normally, we think of the base as one of the sides of a triangle. For three-dimensional shapes, the base is usually the entire top or bottom surface. For prisms and cylinders, it's easiest to think of the base as the top because that's what we see in the picture, but there's also a base on the bottom that is the exact same size and shape. The base of a rectangular prism is a rectangle, and the base of a cylinder is a circle. The cone and pyramid also have a base, which you can see as a circle and rectangle respectively. The sphere does not have a base because it's completely round. Very rarely, a question might mention a lateral face of a three-dimensional shape. The word lateral just means side, so the lateral faces are the faces on the sides. A prism has four lateral faces, all of which are rectangles. We can see the front and right lateral faces easily, but there's also a back and left side. The pyramid also has four lateral faces, but all of these are triangles. Technically, the cylinder, sphere, and cone do not have lateral faces, but if you're trying to find the surface area of a cylinder, you'd still need to include the rounded side. You can learn more about surface area in my separate lesson on the topic. Almost every prism that you'll work with on the SAT is going to be a rectangular prism. But don't forget that a cube is a special type of rectangular prism where the length, width, and height are all the same. Like I said before with the square and rectangle, if the SAT asks you to invent your own rectangular prism, it's probably easiest to imagine a cube so that all of the dimensions are equivalent. It's possible that you could get a very hard SAT question about other types of prisms. A triangular prism has bases that are triangles. The other sides are still rectangles. Basically, any shape can be turned into a prism. For example, a hexagonal prism has two hexagons connected by a bunch of rectangles. If for some weird reason you need to find the volume of a prism, you can always get it by finding the area of the base and multiplying by the height. Just don't let the direction of the prism confuse you. The base is always the shape that the prism type is named after. The height, then, doesn't always need to go up and down. It's the distance between the two bases. Again, other types of prisms showing up in SAT questions would be extremely rare. It would also be rare to have other types of pyramids. The reference sheet gives us the formula for a rectangular pyramid, but a square pyramid would use the same formula. The only difference is that the length and width would be the same. I guess it's possible that you could be asked about a triangular pyramid, maybe for a difficult surface area question. A triangular pyramid has a base that's a triangle, and each of the lateral faces is still a triangle, but now there are only three of them instead of the usual four. Those last few slides were very advanced, so if you're trying to memorize this lesson, start with the beginning. There are a few other geometry vocabulary words that I left out of this lesson because I covered them in more detail in other videos. You can learn about different types of angles in my angle rules lesson, and you can learn about sine, cosine, and tangent in my trigonometry lesson. A lot of geometry is also less about geometry itself and more about understanding word problems, like saying that one line is twice as long as another. Hopefully those kinds of things are just part of your English vocabulary. But if I forgot anything that you think is important, please comment on this video with the word and a brief definition. It's a great way to help out other SAT students. As you practice geometry, the next step is to get good at following instructions. It's important to know what individual words mean, but a lot of hard geometry questions are about putting those words together and literally drawing a picture of what they say. For many people, the reason they struggle with geometry is that they are not very good at closely reading and meticulously following instructions. At least now, you don't have any excuses for not knowing the definitions of the specific geometry vocabulary words. Thanks for watching.